this feeling that something was terribly wrong with the world that we live in, but you couldn't figure out just what it was. Then you've come to the right place. Secret societies, mystery religions, and the Illuminati have been controlling our reality since the beginning of time. But not anymore, because there is an awakening happening, and you are about to become a part of it. Welcome to The Glory of the Stars, a series of studies in Biblical Astrology. I am E. Raymond Capt, Bible archaeologist and historian. This set of studies, The Glory of the Stars, is designed to show that the physical universe is intended to declare and display the majesty of the Creator, and that the constellations known today as the Zodiac tells the gospel of Jesus Christ through the names that God gave to the stars. Astrologers have incorporated into the constellations a mythological system designed to control the entire world through fortune-telling, sorcery, and witchcraft. However, the zodiac, when correctly understood, says nothing about mysterious forces influencing one's destiny, but on the contrary, declares the glory of God as embodied in the person, mission, work, and redemptive achievements of His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. As an introduction to our study of the glory of the stars, let us mentally go back in time, some 3,000 years ago, to the little village of Bethlehem in Palestine. A young shepherd, David by name, is bringing the last lagging sheep into the sheepfold. The sun is setting behind the hills to the west, and as the afterglow fades from crimson to blue, David, his work done, leans on a stone wall and gazes into the sky. A wisp of breeze from the great sea touches the grass, and a night bird calls to his mate. The first stars of night begin to glimmer as pinpoints of light in the darkening sky. The son of Jesse reflects, How were all the wonders of the universe made? The answer comes to David as faith possesses him. The heavens were made at the Eternal's order, and all their hosts by his mere word. As David continues to look up, his, the heavens become filled with stars, and poetic inspiration wells up within his soul. He whispers the words of a psalm. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day utter speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun. Having declared that the heavens reveal God's glory, the psalmist informs us that the heavens declare a message in a language that is understood by all peoples. Obviously the stars as such do show forth his handiwork, but seemingly explain little about the glory of God. Then how can the stars be made to speak? And in a universal language, everyone can understand. The answer is quite evident. Pictures speak in all dialects. They speak a universal language understood by all peoples everywhere. And it is well known that ancient races drew charts of the stars, today known as the constellations. The existence of these star figures have been traced in all ages and among all nations, with their features settled and fixed from the most distant periods. This indicates that somewhere in the earliest ages of man's existence, the visible stars were named. Certain ones were ranged in a group by someone thoroughly familiar with the laws of astronomy. Those names and groupings were at the same time included in certain figures, natural or imaginary, but intensely symbolic and significant. Today we know them as the constellations. Twelve constellations make up the figures known as the zodiac. These major star groupings form a belt which circles the sky close to the plane of the Earth's orbit around the sun. Modern star atlases list them in the following order. Aries, Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, Leo, Virgo, Libra, Scorpio, Sagittarius, Capricorn, Aquarius, and Pisces. Who framed this system of star groupings? 
What was the original purpose of their pictorial images? What were they meant to signify? These questions have been unanswered by Bible scholars. But should they remain unanswered? We have biblical justification to attempt to find the answers. Reading from Genesis 1, verse 14. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. We note that when God created the heavenly worlds, he said, And let them be for signs. A sign is something arbitrarily selected and appointed to represent some other thing. So to make any sense of the creative record, we must admit that God intended these orbs of light, we call stars, as expressions of some special teaching, something different from what is normally deductible from them. Interpreters of Scripture have been at a loss to tell us what the stars were meant to signify over and above what is evidenced by their own nature, and yet there should not be such a total blank on the subject. Light on this subject has been at hand all the while. However, for ages, this field of study on the stars has been almost entirely left to a superstitious and idolatrous astrology, which has perverted a divine science. This series of studies will show that there is a great original divine science connected with the stars a science which astrology has prostituted to its own base ends, and which it is our duty as Christians to search out and turn it to its proper evangelic use. It is generally believed today that Roman and Greek mythology gave birth to the zodiac. However, archaeological research has found that all the earlier ancient nations of the world, the Chaldean, Egyptian, Persian, Indian, even the Chinese astronomers recognize the same signs, invariant but recognizable similarities, both as to the meaning of their names and their order. This would indicate that the zodiacs of all the ancient nations were but copies of an even older zodiac. This in turn gives evidence of a far greater antiquity for the zodiac than ever imagined. This also raises the question, just when did the zodiac originate and where? To find the answer to that question, let us turn to the scriptures. In the book of Job, generally believed to be the oldest book in the Bible, the names of several stars and constellations are mentioned as being both ancient and well-known. In all 42 chapters of the book of Job, there is not one reference to Israelite history nor to the law. This suggests that the writer lived in an early, earlier time. He lived before the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, hence before Abraham. From repeated astronomical illusions contained in the book of Job, various mathematicians have calculated that Job lived and wrote somewhere about 2600 B.C. This date would carry us back over 1500 years before Homer and about 2000 years before Thales, the first of the Greek philosophers. And yet, in the time of Job, the heavens were already charted and arranged astronomically in the manner of the constellations as we know them today. In Job 9, verse 9, Job, speaking of God, says, Which maketh Arcturus, Orion, the Pleiades, and the chambers of the south. Arcturus is a name still connected with the constellation, the Great Bear. In Job 38, verses 31 and 2, this time God is speaking to Job. Canst thou bind the sweet influences, or cluster, of Pleiades, that be the seven sisters, or loose the bands of Orion? Canst thou bring forth Mazoreth, that's the constellations of the zodiac, in his season? Obviously, man could exercise no control over the movements of the constellations, but must await each sign in the order of its season. God continues speaking to Job, Or canst thou guide Arcturus with his sons? The revised version gives the bear with her train or sons. Job 41, verse 1, Job speaks of Cetus, the sea monster. Most Bible scholars agree that the constellation of Drago, or the dragon, that is the figure between the great and little bear, is referred to in Job 26, verse 13, which reads, By his spirit he hath garnished the heavens, 
His hand hath formed the crooked serpent. The word garnished, as used by the translators in verse 13, means make beautiful or as a decoration. But it also carries a further meaning, summons or warning, which falls in precisely with the whole idea of the celestial luminaries or stars as being used for signs representing the gospel written in the skies. Thus Job describes the power, majesty, and works of God. He informs us that God himself is responsible for the naming and the placing of these constellations. The psalmist also states that God named the stars. Reading from Psalms 147, verse 4, He telleth the number of the stars, he calleth them all by their names. A similar statement is made by the prophet Isaiah, who declares reading from Isaiah 40, verse 26. Lift up your eyes on high, and behold, who hath created these things, meaning stars, that bringeth out their host by number. He calleth them all by names by the greatness of his might, for that he is strong in power, not one faileth. We find many other scriptural references to the constellations. Isaiah 13, verse 10. The stars of heaven and the constellations thereof. Amos 13, verse 8 reads, Seek him that maketh the seven stars and Orion. The revised version reads, The Pleiades and Orion. In Acts 28, verse 11, the constellations of Gemini the twins is referred to as the name of a ship, using the names of Castor and Pollux. Thus we find that the scriptures are not silent as to the great antiquity of the signs and constellations of the zodiac. It is a matter of inspired record that God, after Adam's fall, made known to Adam his purposes concerning the serpent and the seed of the woman. The revelation concerned the whole gospel, including the promises. This knowledge was given not to Adam alone, but was to be made known to all mankind that followed afterwards. Adam and his immediate descendants lived hundreds of years. So they had ample time for observations and study, time to devise a means of recording and transmitting to all men the Creator's plan for humanity. The canopy of virgin stars was over them, just waiting to be named, grouped, and defined with certain symbols of the ideas they wished to convey. In this way, they could transmit and explain to their posterity the names and figures assigned to each star grouping. Some of the stars are brighter than others, as the scriptures state, for one star differeth from another in glory. Some stars are called wandering stars because they change place continually, going and returning at fixed intervals. However, some stars hold their place from age to age, with variations so slight as scarcely to be observed in thousands of years. Some of the brighter stars are nestled together with in particular groups, so as to be easily distinguished. By means of these facts, Adam and his descendants were enabled to design pictures in the heavens using these bright stars or clusters of stars that have scarcely changed their position in the thousands of years since Adam. These constellations or pictures embrace all the principal stars visible to the naked eye. Among the objects of nature, none could have been selected as appropriately as these stars for the purpose of recording and conveying unchanging ideas to distant ages. Their message was utterly imperishable, as long as man could was cognizant of the divine nature of the starry pictures. There should be no doubt but that the ancient biblical patriarchs were the men who first drew the celestial hieroglyphics, named and grouped the stars, laid out the zodiac and its signs, and made the heavens a picture gallery for all the world to view. Thus all mankind could gaze and read the wondrous story of the promises concerning the coming Redeemer, the redemption, and the redeemed. For over 2,500 years before the written word, man was not left in ignorance and darkness as to God's purposes and counsel, nor were they without hope as to their ultimate deliverance from all evil and the evil one. 
Adam, to whom was given that wondrous promise of redemption, imparted it to his posterity as a most precious heritage, the foundation of all their faith, the substance of all their hope, the object of all their desire. All mankind was given the knowledge of the story of this starry gospel of Jesus Christ. It was only after mankind lapsed into idolatry and lost the original meaning of the constellations that nations invented stories from their own imaginations and horoscopic astrology was born under satanic influences. In spiritual blindness, men could no longer understand the celestial story and did not know what to make of its foreshowing. And this condition exists today in the hearts and minds of millions of persons. This condition should not be allowed to remain. Today we have the light of God's Word in written form. And in the light of God's fuller revelation found in the Scriptures, we can now visually read and understand the constellations that proclaim the story of the One whose self-given name is the Light of the World, who dwelt among men so that they might behold His glory. This study may at first sound strange, and its undertaking may be deemed adventurous and fanciful, but if you will hear me out, look at and weigh the facts, I am sure you will come out of this study all the more filled with adoration for the goodness and wonder of the eternal Creator of the stars. In the course of our studies, we will see portrayed in the stars the fulfillment of Genesis 3, verses 14 and 15, And the Lord said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between her seed and thy seed. It, meaning he, shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. You will need no preliminary scientific knowledge of astronomy in order to follow what will be presented in this series of studies. All that is needed is your Bible. We will be dealing with the twelve major constellations of the Zodiac as constituting twelve graphic chapters in a picturesque book of divine revelation. This message that God by His Spirit caused to be written in the sky is as one, by the same Spirit, with what He has caused to be written in His Word, the Scriptures. If this be true, then we should find a correlation between the star figures and the Scriptures. For it is by way of the Bible that we became aware of the Gospel of the stars. In examining the constellations, we find that most of the brighter stars making up the sky pictures have Arabic and Hebrew names that have come down to us from remote times. These Arabic and Hebrew names have symbolic meanings which play an important part in our understanding the true representation of the constellations. And in some instances, where the original zodiacal picture has been lost or perverted, the ancient meaning of the star names facilitate its restoration. In short, the key to understanding the zodiac lies in the ancient Hebrew and Arabic and Persian names, which still adhere to the stars. These names are found in the most ancient zodiacal charts, centuries before Christ. In all star and celestial albums, the constellations are represented by figures of men, women, animals, birds, and reptiles, as well as inanimate objects. The configurations are abstractions bounded by certain, but by no means defined lines. Nothing in the star groupings themselves even suggests the figures. In other words, the pictures in the stars are mental pictures, just enclosing several visible stars set in a pattern that has little relationship to the pictures itself. And since all the ancient nations of antiquity had the same pictures or signs, they had to have been told what each star pattern represented from a source older than themselves. Because the Bible parallels, as we shall see throughout the study, that source was Adam and his immediate descendants, each of the twelve major constellations of the zodiac are associated with three minor constellations, sometimes called decans, making a total of 48 star pictures in all. The minor constellations usually amplify the meaning of their associated major constellation. 
In this first tape, I will cover just the first constellation, Virgo the Virgin, and its accompanying minor constellations. Virgo is the largest of the constellations in the heaven and represents a woman with a branch in her right hand and some ears of corn in her left. She is lying prostrate. The name of this sign in Hebrew is Bethula, which means a virgin. In Arabic, she is known as Adara, meaning the pure virgin. This woman illustrates the holder and bringer forth of an illustrious seed. The constellation of Virgo is also a picture of the fulfillment of Isaiah 7, verse 14, that is, as quoted by Matthew 1, verse 23. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. The bright star in the ear of corn held by Virgo in her left hand is called in Arabic al jamach meaning the branch. The prophet Zechariah writes of this branch, reading from Zechariah 3, verse 8, For behold, I will bring forth my servant the branch. This same branch is described by God in Isaiah 42, verse 1, in these words, Behold my servant. It is significant that Christ referred to himself in John 12, verses 23 and 24, as a corn or seed of wheat, which needed to fall and die in order to obtain its proper fruitfulness. One of the stars in the branch held by the woman is named al Muradin, which means, Who shall come down, or who shall have dominion? This star is also known by the Chaldean word, Vinamatrix, which means, The sun or branch who cometh. Thus the meaning of the star names and the symbology of the constellation of Virgo are identical with the language of the prophecies of the Bible. Christ the branch is the central theme of the Christian gospel. Without him and the redemption wrought by him, all humanity is fallen and helplessly in sin. Acts 4 verse 10 states that there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It is therefore significant that the very first sign which comes before us as we examine the celestial book in the heavens is the form and figure of a virgin. And the greater wonder is that a virgin could conceive a child. In this first sign, Virgo, the name points to her as a prominent subject. But in the first of the three minor signs of Virgo, where the woman appears again, the name Coma points to the child as a great subject. The ancient Egyptian zodiac observed at Dundera, and dated at least 4,000 years old, pictures this constellation as a woman with a child in her arms. They called the child Horus, or the desired, or the longed for. The Egyptian name for the complete sign is Shesnu, meaning the desired son. However, the true meaning of this child is found in Haggai 2, verse 7, which states, The desire of all nations shall come, referring to Jesus Christ. This same child held by the woman is the same infant that Luke wrote about, reading from Luke 2, verse 40. The child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. While the constellation of Coma reveals that the coming seed of the woman was to be a child born, a son given. He was to be more than just a son. He was to have two natures in one person, that is, God and man. This dual nature is seen in the second minor sign of Virgo, Centaurus the Centaur. Here we find a man's head, trunk, and arms coupled with a horse's body and legs. The figure is facing east and shown charging with a leveled lance of spear in his right hand. In both the Hebrew and the Arabic, the meaning of this constellation is the the despised. A parallel is found in Isaiah 53, verse 3. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, 
and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. A Christian creed states, For the right faith is that we believe and confess that our Lord, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is God and man, God of the substance of the Father, begotten of his mother, born in the world, perfect God and perfect man. This is a great mystery, but so the scriptures teach that Christ our Savior possesses a double nature, not by conversion of the Godhead into flesh, but by taking manhood into God, in the unity of one person, who accordingly is Emmanuel, meaning God with us. The great work that the seed of the woman is to accomplish is illustrated by the third minor constellation of Virgo, Budis, the coming one. Here we have a mighty man with a spear in his right hand and a sickle in his left. The Egyptians called him Smapt, which means one who subdues and governs. The Greeks, not fully recognizing the meaning of this sign, called it the Plowman and gave it its present name of Budis. In older zodiacs, we find Budis not as a plowman, but the guardian and keeper of a sheepfold. One of the most common and expressive symbols attached to Christ in the scriptures is that of a shepherd. Isaiah prophesied of he who shall, quote, feed his flock like a shepherd. Peter also describes Christ as the shepherd and bishop of our soul. Christ says of himself, reading from John 10, verses 11 and 14, I am the good shepherd, and know my sheep, and am known of mine. And Jesus continues on in verse 27 and 8, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I shall give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. The sickle in the hand of Budis represents him as a reaper. John, writing in Revelation 14, verse 16, beheld Christ as the coming great judge and harvester, coming to reap the harvest of the earth. John wrote, And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. There is also a wealth of meaning in the names of the stars making up this constellation. Arcturus, a bright star in the figure's left knee, is mentioned in Job 9, verse 9. Its name means, He cometh. The star al katruk in the spear means the branch or treading underfoot. Isaiah 63, verse 3 reads, I will tread them in mine anger and trample them in my fury. Another star name means who separates. In Matthew 25, verse 32, Jesus declares, He is the one who will separate. Quoting, And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, and a shepherd divided his sheep from the goats. Other star names mean who bruises, the preserver, and the pierces. Zechariah 12, verse 10 states, They shall look upon me whom they have pierced. Bootes, together with the other associated constellations in the sign of Virgo, illustrates the coming of a Savior, born of a virgin, called the desire of all nations, having two natures in one, that is, God with us, slain for sin. Finally, triumphal over death, he shall return again. Then he shall tread the winepress of the wrath of God and cleanse the earth of all evil and establish his rule of righteousness. This constellation completes the first chapter of the celestial book, and like the book of Genesis, it contains the outline of the whole volume as regards the person of the coming one. Next, tape number two will deal with the second chapter of our divine picturesque book, Libra the Scales. Now let tape run out before turning over for a duplicate recording of this tape.
Tape number one explained how the constellations or signs of the zodiac could be traced back to the earliest ages of man, back to Adam and his immediate descendants, who were the first to draw and define the signs of the zodiac as a means of recording and transmitting to all men God's great plan for humanity, starting with the constellation of Virgo and its accompanying minor signs. For this study, I will start with Libra, the scales. Libra's name in Arabic is Al-Zubini, which means purchase or redemption. The brightest star in the lower scale is named Zubin al Ginubi, which means the purchase or the price which is deficient. This points to the fact that man is weighed in the balance and found wanting. Another bright star in the upper scale is named Zubin al Shemali, which means the price which covers. This can only symbolize the seed of the woman who became an atoning sacrifice. He paid the price that covers. Revelation 5 verse 9 records this redeeming sacrifice in these words. They sang a new song, saying, Thou art worthy, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood. Zubin al Shemali is also known as al Gubi, meaning heaped up high, which tells of the infinite value of this redemptive price. In all the Old Testament prophecies, in all the ritual observations connected with them, in all the New Testament promises, we find the doctrine of salvation through the sacrifice of the seed of the woman. Jesus Christ is our only substitute. Jesus Christ paid the required ransom to redeem man from sin. The three minor constellations of Libra reveal what the price was to be, how it was to be paid, and what was to be the result. The first is Crux, the cross, sometimes referred to as the Southern Cross. This figure consists of four bright stars placed in the form of a cross, stationed in the darkest section of the heavens, in the lowest part of the sphere. It is readily recognized by every beholder. Long before the birth of Christ, the cross of Libra was a sacred symbol. The Persians and Egyptians both worshipped it. In Egypt, the sacred ta or cross, was a sign and symbol of life, that is, natural life given up and eternal life procured. But they were ignorant of its true meaning, atonement, finished, perfect, and complete, never to be repeated. The Egyptians represented Crux as a lion with his head turned backward and his tongue hanging out of his mouth as if in thirst. Here we have but another symbol of Christ as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. One of the few expressions made by Christ as he died on the cross concerned his consuming thirst. The Hebrew name of Crux is Adam, which means cutting off. Daniel 9, verse 26, refers to the fact that after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. And Christ was cut off by being condemned and crucified in A.D. 33. Ever since Jesus Christ bore the shame of the cross, it has been a sacred and most significant emblem to all Christian believers. Paul would glory in nothing but in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the constellation of Crux stands among the starry symbols of ancient astronomy, precisely as it stands in Christianity, a token of the price which our redemption was to be bought. The second minor constellation of Libra, Lupus, or Victima the Victim, which gives us a still fuller and clearer indication of the nature and payment of that price of redemption. The modern name of this sign is lupus, meaning a wolf, because in modern zodiacs it looks like a wolf, but there is no ancient authority for it. It may be any animal. 
The ancient Egyptian zodiac at Dendera perhaps best explains the meaning of lupus. There, the constellation is pictured as a little child with its fingers on its lips. Although the Egyptian mythology refers to the child as Horus, the beloved son of Osiris and a virgin, he was also called Surah, meaning a lamb. Isaiah 53, verse 7, prophesies of Jesus. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he opens not his mouth. In the picture of lupus, or victima, the victim, the slain victim is pierced with a dart barbed in the form of a cross by the hand of the centaur himself, and as we pointed out, represented Christ himself. Do you see the significance of this? This is the important element in the mystical transaction on the cross, that Christ sacrificed himself. Jesus said, reading from John 10, verses 17 and 18, I lay down my life that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. Therefore, we see in Lupus a celestial preview of the scriptural message that he who knew no sin considered to become an offering for sin. He felt the agony and shame of the cross that we might have eternal redemption through his blood. This shameful cross was only a prelude to a glorious crown and throne, which brings us to the third minor constellation of Libra, Corona, the crown. Corona, or the northern crown, as it is called, is a semicircle of stars that arise just east of the northern part of Budis. It is one of the constellations which can be easily recognized as bearing a resemblance to the object for which it is named. Most of the principal stars in this sign are of the white twinkling kind, so that, so that the crown is fully jeweled. The Arabic name for this constellation means an ornament or jewel. The Hebrew name for this sign is a Torah, meaning a royal crown. This star is found quite a few times in the Old Testament, but Isaiah 28, verse 5, is one of the most fitting references to it. In that day shall the Lord of hosts be for a crown, the word used here is a Torah, of glory, and for a diadem of beauty, unto the residue of his people. The crown, following so close after the cross, reminds us of the statement regarding the triumph of Jesus Christ. Reading from Revelation 5, verse 9, Thou art worthy, for thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood. And reading from Philippians 2, verses 9 and 10, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. Thus ends the second celestial chapter, with glory to the Lamb. An extension of this prophecy is yet future, when at the second coming of the Redeemer, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. To summarize the first two major constellations, Virgo and Libra, with their minor signs, it portrays the basic theme of Christianity. A child shall be born of a virgin, called the promised seed, should grow up into manhood and have two natures, divine and human. He should suffer and die to redeem mankind from their sins, to overcome death, to be exalted by the Father as the glory of God. We have now come to the third major consolation, Scorpio the Scorpion. Here we have the figure of a mammoth scorpion with his tail uplifted in anger, 
it appears to be trying to strike a man known as Ophiuchus, who is struggling with the serpent. The scorpion is a deadly enemy, as we learn in Revelation chapter 9, with poison in its sting. In all ages, Scorpio was known as the accursed and warlike constellation. To the Mayans, it was known as the sign of the death god. The meaning of the star names making up this sign are all suggestive of conflict, the wounding, tearing, attack to the enemy, oppression, all of a deadly wounding in that conflict. Such a conflict is clearly set forth in the scriptures between the serpent and the woman's seed, starting with the attempt to destroy all the males of the seed of Abraham, as found in the book of Exodus, chapter 1, the efforts of Athaliah to destroy all the royal seed, as we read in Second Kings 11, verse 1, and Herod's slaying of all the male babes in Bethlehem. This conflict develops into the real wounding received at the cross when the scorpion struck the woman's seed. This battle did not end at the cross, but extends today to all Christians and involves the kingdom of Jesus Christ to clearly indicate that this conflict only apparently ended in defeat on the cross we have the first two minor constellations belonging to Scorpio presented as one picture. Here we have the figure of a mighty man, Ophiuchus, wrestling with a gigantic serpent. The serpent's head is trying to reach up to a crown known as corona that is immediately above the head of the serpent. The man is grasping the serpent with both hands, disabling the monster by his superior power and holding the serpent fast so that he cannot reach the crown. One foot of the man is lifted above the scorpion's tail as if it had been stung and hurt by the scorpion. The other foot is in the act of crushing the scorpion's head. In Greek mythology, Ophiuchus was known as the healer, the physician, the health giver, the desired one, and the worthiest of all the gods. The symbol of the serpent entwined around him is to this day the symbol of the medical arts. All this is yet another perversion of the primitive truth pictured in the stars, that the coming one, that is Christ, in overcoming the serpent, should become the great healer of all mankind. Christ is the resurrection and the life, the great healer, the heavenly physician. We do not necessarily see the physical image of the devil and Satan. Often he is only a dark and subtle intelligence operating within a person to deceive and destroy. However, in the starry configurations, he is a picture and repeated at every turn of the constellations, precisely as we find him presented in the sacred scriptures. In the constellation of serpents, we see the symbolic picture of Satan, looking up and reaching forth to seize the crown, symbolized by the minor constellation Corona, which is immediately above the head of the serpent. Satan is being kept from taking the crown only because he is held fast by Ophiuchus, who represents Jesus Christ. The third minor constellation of Scorpio is Hercules, the mighty man. The figure in this sign is of a mighty man down on one knee with his heel uplifted as if wounded. The man wears the skin of a lion he has slain and is holding a great club in his right hand. In his left hand is a three-headed creature, with his left foot is set directly on the head of the great dragon. The meaning of some of the star names making up this constellation are the head of him who bruises, the branch kneeling, 
the wounding, the sin offering, punishing, and treading underfoot. The Greeks and the Romans worshipped and honored this figure as Hercules and considered him the greatest of all their hero gods. According to their mythical accounts, Hercules was the God-begotten man who from cradle to death accomplished the most difficult and wonderful feats in the line of vanishing great evil powers. The prevailing theory held by many is that the story of Hercules is a purely Greek invention, but it has been found to date back in all aspects to Egypt, Phoenicia, and India centuries before the Greeks. In the zodiac of Dindera in Egypt, this constellation was also a human figure with a club. They called him Baal, which means, Who cometh? The Phoenicians honored Hercules as representing a savior. And in spite of the ancient perversions which have woven fables and gods around the ancient names, their meanings we can still see foretold the mighty works which the seed of the woman, that is Jesus Christ, should perform. Reading from Psalm 91, verse 13. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder. The young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample underfoot. Sagittarius the archer is the major subject of the fourth chapter of our celestial book. Here we again have the figure of a centaur indicating the double-natured seed of the virgin, the Son of God and Son of Man. The figure is that of a mighty warrior with a bow and an arrow, riding forth majestically. The barbed arrow in his bow is aimed at the heart of the scorpion. John the Revelator, in his apocalyptic vision, saw the same mighty conqueror going forth. Reading from Revelation 6, verse 2, And I saw and beheld a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. The psalmist also wrote of this archer who shall presently come forth, all powerful, to war with Satan and his servant brood. Reading from Psalms 64, verses 7 to 9. But God shall shoot at them with an arrow. Suddenly shall they be wounded, so they shall make their own tongue to fall upon themselves. All that see them shall flee away, and all men shall fear, and shall declare the work of God, for they shall wisely consider of his doing. The name Sagittarius in Hebrew is Kesith, which means the archer, and in Arabic it is called al kaz meaning the arrow. The two brightest stars in this constellation in Hebrew mean the gracious one and the going or sending forth. The ancient Akkadian name of this sign is Nunkai, meaning Prince of the Earth. The Egyptians called this sign Kim, which means He Conquers. According to Greek myths, Sagittarius was a great teacher of mankind in heavenly wisdom, medicine, and all noble arts. He was a gracious king, especially blessed of God, whose name every generation shall remember and whom the people shall praise forever and ever. Although the Greeks recognized the attributes expressed by this sign, even retained its ancient star names, the original meaning of Sagittarius had been lost by their time. The Greeks understood that the archer portrayed in the stars was at war with the scorpion, but failed to recognize its true meaning the seed of the woman, in the person of the glorified Christ, would pierce and wound the serpent, destroy his works and power, and disable him forever. 
This same story is found in the Scriptures when the King of Kings and Lord of Lords comes forth to do battle against the beast, the false prophet, and all their armies in that great day of the Lord. He comes in the form of a man sitting upon a white horse in righteousness, judging and making war, the same as Sagittarius. The first of the three minor constellations of Sagittarius takes up the subject of praise for the conqueror. Lyre the harp. Most atlases depict the figure in this constellation by an eagle holding a harp, or sometimes a harp placed over an eagle. In the most ancient zodiacs, this minor constellation is marked by the figure of an eagle or hawk, another enemy of the serpent, who darts forth upon his prey from the heavenly heights with great suddenness and power. This suddenness again accords with the saying ascribed to Christ in the Gospel. Reading from 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 3, For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them. Revelation 22, verse 12, also speaks of the suddenness of the return of Christ. Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me. The constellation of Lyre contains one of the most superb of all the first magnitude stars. Its name is Vega, which means, He shall be exalted. Its actual magnitude is very great, perhaps a hundred times that of our sun. About 14,000 years ago, Vega was the north polar star, and in consequence of the precession of the equinoxes, it will occupy the same position about 11,000 years hence. Two other conspicuous stars between the fourth and fifth magnitudes have names meaning an eagle and springing up or ascending, as in praise. The placing of the harp, the oldest of stringed instruments, known during the time of Adam, according to Genesis 4, verse 21, following Sagittarius, connects preeminent gladness, joy, delight, and praise with the actions of this great archer with his bow and arrow. Thus Sagittarius is portrayed in the heavens as answering to the Lamb. As John beheld him in song and praise, reading from Revelation 5, verse 13, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. The second minor constellation of Sagittarius is Ara, the altar. Nearly all the star charts show the figure of an altar covered with burning fire to denote this constellation. The fire is burning downward, snittically, toward the lower regions of darkness, called in Tartarus, which is known as the outer darkness. This is the area toward the covered and invisible South Pole. The word ara was sometimes used by the Greeks to imply a curse or the effects of a curse, such as ruin or destruction. In ara, we see depicted a coming judgment, symbolized by the burning fire. Revelation 20, verse 2 tells upon whom this judgment is to fall. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. The ultimate judgment then followed, reading from Revelation 20, verse 10, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. The third minor constellation of Sagittarius is Drago the dragon. The figure of this constellation is a great serpent wound about at least one half of the northern sky. 
His tail alone extends over the territory of the third part of the stars. The Greek name for this sign is dragon, or drago means trodden on. This is in perfect harmony with the scriptures. Reading from Psalms 91, verse 13. The dragon shalt thou trample underfoot. The Egyptian zodiac in Dendera shows this sign as a serpent under the forefoot of Sagittarius and is named Herfent, which means serpent accursed. The most prominent star in one of the dragon's coils is named in Hebrew Thuban, which means the subtle. About 4,600 years ago, Thuban was the North Pole Star, and much closer to the true pole than Polaris is at the present time. Polaris is our present North Polar Star. The meaning of some of these stars making up this sign are the long serpent, dragon, the head of the subtle, who is to be destroyed, and the punished enemy. Drago thus represents the sly and creeping deceiver, the devil called the dragon and that old serpent. The dragon and the serpent are one and the same. No man has ever seen a dragon, living or dead, yet all men talk of the dragon. In all ages, this image or evil power has figured conspicuously in man's myths, traditions, in his art and literature. In all cases, the dragon symbolizing evil is vanished by the works of gods, heroes, and saints. Yet there is nothing in earthly zoology to explain or account for such a creature. Mythology says the dragon is the power that guarded the golden apples in the famous garden of the Hesperides, hindering men from getting them. Does not this symbolize the devil, the old serpent, the dragon, who deceived Adam and thus kept mortal man from the true fruits of the tree of life? Mythology says this dragon was slain by Hercules. Isn't this portrayed in the astronomical sign of the promised seed of the woman, the coming one, who is pictured with his foot on the head of the dragon? Isaiah refers to the time when the Lord shall come. Reading from Isaiah 27, verse 1, A great and strong sword shall punish Leviathan, the piercing serpent, and he shall slay the dragon. We find the names, the actions, implements, and results of the symbols and the stars are one and the same with the scriptures. Can there be any doubt but that these starry signs in the constellations are but another version of what was written by the prophets and set forth in the scriptures as the true and only hope of man. And there should be no doubt that God meant and ordained a use of the heavenly bodies we call stars, in which they should be for signs and be arranged to signify the glory of God. To those who believe in God, and in his written word, it will seem natural that God would write in symbols his divine teachings. That such symbols were set in the sky is in accordance with what is written in Genesis 1, verses 14 to 16. Let them, speaking of the great lights we call stars, be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. The God who can shape history as to make it prefigure future events can also order nature so as to symbolize his truth as well as to fulfill his will in other ways. We find that the names, the actions, the implements, and the results of the symbols and the stars are one and the same with scriptures. There should be no doubt that God meant and ordained the use of the heavenly bodies we call stars in which they should be for signs and arranged to signify the glory of God.
The next tape, number three, will deal with the constellation of Capricornus, the sea goat, and Aquarius, the water bearer.